um, and we'll just let people come as they can. Um, so first of all, welcome to this Outdoor Recreation Northern Ireland webinar on managing visitors with dogs post-COVID. Um, I think I read recently from what Steve had put out for this webinar, that dog ownership was up 47% during the pandemic. So I think, I think this webinar probably is coming out quite a good time for all of us in terms of considering some of the issues that we're having to face in terms of being landowners, land managers, and facilitating outdoor recreation. So Steve's going to be laying a foundation for us today. So we, we really see this as the start of a series of webinars that we could have, not just webinars, other sort of training events as well, um, around managing dogs in the outdoors. So today we'll be looking at some issues around dog filing, livestock warning, brown nesting birds, commercial dog walking, um, interacting with other visitors, etc., and the importance of green space planning. Um, just in terms of some housekeeping rules um, for the webinar, so, so this meeting will be recorded. If you don't want to be seen in the recording that will go out, just uh, make sure that you have your camera turned off. We do ask that during the presentations you turn your cameras off. That just helps with bandwidth in case we start to experience glitches. Um, so during the presentations, turn off your um, camera, but then during the Q&A session, feel free to switch your camera back on again. And the main place then, whenever the cameras are switched off to direct, is to go into the chat pane. So go top right and open up the chat pane. I can see lots of interaction already. And what we hope to do is to have a really thorough Q&A session towards the end. So rather than sort of Stephen taking questions as we go through today, put your questions into the chat pane and then we'll have a really great discussion later. Um, and what I would also say is watch the chat pane. If somebody's already asked a question you were considering asking, rather than putting in the same question, just give that question a thumbs up. And then that way we know that's definitely something we want to look at in, in more depth in the Q&A session. Then during the Q&A session, feel free to, to, to raise your virtual hand. And by that, we will know um, to, to come to you and then you can verbally put your question or comment um, to Steve and, and to other attendees. So we've got a very simple running order uh, today. So I'm gonna hand over very soon to Stephen Jenkinson. Um, and then after his session, we've got a few case studies. And what was great was in the lead up to this webinar, uh, people emailing me to say, I'd love to share what we're doing. Not necessarily to say that what we're doing is right and it's addressing all the issues, but actually this is what we're trying. This is what seems to be working. So we're going to look at two, three case studies um, and then we're going to go into a Q&A session. So before I hand over to Stephen, let me just introduce Stephen. I'm sure he probably doesn't need that much introduction because Stephen is at the forefront. In fact, he's the, he's the expert really across these islands on managing visitors with dogs. He's got 20 years experience um, on this topic. And I'm sure some of you know Steve from his work across UK and Ireland already. And um, he's been working with the Kennel Club, Culture Ireland, Forestry Commission, National Trust, and several national park authorities. Um, and he lives in Ockney, um, but he travels across the globe um, telling people about the benefits of dog <laughs> I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> um, so it's really great to have Steve here. Um, and then after Steve, we're going to have, as I said earlier, two, three um, case studies, one from Patricia Dean, who is the European Innovation Partnership Project Manager for Ireland's highest mountain. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Then we've got Claudia Duffy, who's the Recreation Manager for the Dublin Mountains Partnership. So we're going to see what they have been doing along with culture. Um, and then we're going to have a colleague, um, Kerry Kirkpatrick, share about um, Borney's Right Side of Outside campaign. And then as, as I say, after that, then we'll have a really good Q&A session. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Stephen, who I think is ready to go. So over to you, Stephen. That's great. Thank you for that introduction, Elizabeth. I'm just wanting to check that you can see my slides at least for you, Elizabeth. Yes, you can so indeed. Brilliant. Thank you. So that's it. That's the big thing done. Hi, good morning to you. It's lovely to, to catch up with you all. My only disappointment is that I'm not over the water in person because I've always really enjoyed my, my trips over uh, to Ireland. Um, but this is also brilliant that we can make this accessible to so many people. So good morning and thanks for that introduction. Uh, so as um, Elizabeth said, I, I kind of call myself a dogs in the outdoor specialist, um, but usually I'm called the dog guy or more often than not the dog poo guy. Um, and that's fine. Uh, uh, where there's muck, there's brass, as they say in my native Yorkshire, so I'm quite happy with that. 
just to give you a little bit of background as to where I'm coming from, I started out my career many years ago uh, with the National Health Service, uh, so very much in terms of people's health and well-being. But then I had a little passion for the outdoors, so I retrained and did other studies and was involved in local authorities and national parks in managing access to the ground. But then about 20 years ago, I just thought this whole thing with people and the dogs in the outdoors could do with managing a whole lot better. Um, so I went and studied the psychology of people and their pets at the University of Southampton. And then I bring all those three things together because to me it's all about human health, access to land and all those things, but actually people and their pets. So that's why I do what I do. And I've worked uh, internationally as far away as New Zealand and Australia, um, but throughout the British Isles as well. So we've got in Scotland, Wildlife Trust, my biggest client at the moment uh, is Natural England, but that varies. So I've done a fair bit of work in Ireland, both north and south, Quilcher, OPW, um, Dublin City Council and in the north as well. Also amazingly working for EDF Energy on a project to build their proposed new nuclear power station in Suffolk because they, if they do build it, it will end up moving where people are currently walking their dogs to somewhere else and we need to make sure that that doesn't adversely impact other people, livestock or wildlife. So that's amazing and I just love what I do, not just for work, but actually I have a real passion where I, I live in Orkney at the moment. Uh, we have a 25 acre croft which is primarily managed for, for wildlife on improved grassland, so stuff like this, but also really proud to have things like black-throated diver, short-eared owl, all these sort of ground listing birds and stuff on my land as well, which I'm passionate about. And we also have livestock here as well. These are Sometimes I graze my neighbour's sheep here. These are used to make Orkney tweed. And I've also had um, livestock attacked on my land as well because we have been in Scotland, there's public access all over it. So I come at this from lots of different levels, but I also love dogs as well. So the key thing for me is how do we make all this work together? Because good management of all these things benefits everybody, whether it's wildlife, other people, livestock or whatever. So let's just have an initial look in terms of uh, the new normal, particularly post COVID of actually what's going on and why it's really important to, to deal with these challenges as well and, and in positive way as much as we can. So we know that dog ownership goes across all socioeconomic groups. In 2019, it was around the 30%, both north and south, uh, uh, a bit more in, in, in the south in terms of dog ownership. But we know that uh, the number of households with dogs has increased by about 33%. As Elizabeth said, overall dog ownership is kind of around 47%, but that's also because households who already had a dog went and got another one in COVID as well. Children in the home is the best predictor of, of um having a dog in the home and people see those of you with dogs will know that you see the dog as a, a fully fledged family member. People want to go on visits in their local green space but also further afield and for some of you your visitors will be local residents but it'll also be day visitors and also people who book to holiday cottage or something like that for a for a week or so. Um, so again this is all telling us actually how do we get our information to the right people about where we want them to go what to do. There'll be some people who are very active doing things like dog sports, like canny cross or all those sort of things, cross country running with dogs. But we also need to remember that for some people, probably having that dog is maybe the only reason that they go out in green space a day or even have the, the feeling that they actually want to get up that day. Um, so we need to remember those things as well in terms of all these things about, yes, there can be problems, but there's also things about lots of stuff about very good uh, mental and physical health. You actually have some great data in Ireland as well. This, uh, this study was published in 2011 and it looked at 2007 data. And basically it's just saying, and it's useful because it's all of Ireland as well, basically where you've got more households, you're gonna have more dogs. Uh, the only exception to that is in the very core areas of places like Belfast and Dublin, where actually you tend to have real inner city dwellers are less likely to have dogs, but elsewhere, and um, these are households, but you've got fewer households, if you like, to the west and in the centre. But overall, it's pretty evenly sped. But where you've got more houses, you're going to have more dogs. And as I saying, there's lots of good things about dog walking and we need to always remember these. This is really important as well, because if you're looking for funding for whatever project or interventions you want to do after listening to this or that you're already on with, instead of this going to your members or your councillors or your board to say, oh, this is another project about livestock worrying or about dog poo or whatever it is, you can actually access additional funding saying, yes, we're going to deal with all these problems, but we're also going to try and make sure we capture the human health benefits. Um, because I know it's quite a lot of the work that I'm doing uh, in England at the moment is actually underpinned by money that's looking for improving people's health. So that's really important to remember. Plus it sounds it's a more positive way to engage with dog owners. Because we know that having a dog makes people more likely to exercise in all weathers. We know people with dogs recover from illnesses more quickly and go to the doctor less. 
helps them have more social contact with other people. And actually having that exercise is also good for the pets as well. So that's really good and we need to remember that. However, let's remember the reality and I'm sure these are things that you get in your email uh, inboxes every day. There's still problems. We know there's these realities here and we shouldn't shy away from these either. They've got things like the poo being left on the path, wildlife being disturbed, chase my sheep, uh, even raided our picnic. I say that in general, I'm not trying to get at this, um, this Labrador who looks like he's maybe raided one or two picnics either at home, but um, either way, there are these things that we need to deal with these both, and that's really important. Just before we get into that, I just want to bring up the first poll of the day. This will give us a bit of a test as well. So Kerry will bring that up for you. I think there'll be a link appearing in your screen now. And let me just flick onto that myself. Here we go. So this is just going to ask some questions about you if you've um, driven a car in the last 12 months. So let's just see that. I don't have that there at the moment for me, Kerry. Elizabeth, is it with you? Because that might just be something at my end, maybe. Oh, there we are. So click. Excellent. Is it by magic? Just click on that form and you'll see something comes up. So this is a question for you. Nobody's taking a record of this. Nobody's going to report this to your managers or, or the guardian or anything like that. Um, if you've driven a car in the last a van over the last 12 months, which of these statements most applies to you? You've never exceeded any speed limit. You've sometimes unintentionally exceeded, exceeded the speed limit. You've sometimes intentionally exceeded the speed limit, but you know it was safe to do so. Or you habitually ignore speed limits because you know best how far to go. So just select one of those and press submit, and then we'll just see what comes up there. Brilliant. 20 responses, a few more. You'll see that they're anonymous, so you don't need to worry about that. I can see one or two nervous faces on the screen, so that's, um, but that's fine. Well, that is not going any further. That's great. I think we've topped out there, so that's great. So let's just see what you've come up to. You, you've some people who've never exceeded any speed limit. My goodness, I thought people were also uh, well behaved and in awe of rules and regulations. Um, that you're no, honestly, I'm just cheeky. Um, sometimes some people unintentionally exceeded the speed limit, and sometimes people intentionally, and that's good. Thank you for being honest. Uh, and one person who habitually ignored the speed limits. Uh, so that's brilliant. Uh, so thank you for that. I'll just pop back onto my screen now. Uh, I'll just need to reshare, I think. So let's just go back onto here. There we are. So that's really helpful. And thank you for being so honest about that. Because what I want to, to tell you is that basically we talk about dogs and all this sort of thing, but actually like everything else, whether it's mountain bikers or disposable barbecues or whatever it is, this is a people management issue. And if generally we look at people in society, we're going to get three types. We're going to get the angels. They're the people who've never exceeded the speed limit and they always clean up after themselves and, and are perfect, perfect people. Maybe sometimes a little bit boring to live with, but we need people like that to set the standards. Um, but I'm not putting my hand up to be one of those. And I noticed nobody else did too. Then we've got some people who are devils. So these are the people about whatever you may do, um, and however you make it make it easy for them to, to know what's expected and do it, they're just going to, if you like, stick two fingers up at society and do what they blinky well like and, you know, either ignore speed limits because they think they know how fast to go or whatever. Uh, and you probably know some people like that as well. Maybe I'm sure not working in this sector, um, but there are people like that in society. And I make the point that whilst we talk about uh, not that much about legislation here, particularly because it, it varies from country to country, um, but really legislation the, is the only way you're going to get um, through to those people. So if you're going to use enforcement methods, methods, those are the people to target. And then there's this group in the middle, and I'll put my hand up to this because that's most of us, fallen angels. You know, we're not perfect. We're trying to get on with our lives. We're trying to, when we're driving, get to school or shops or work or whatever it is, you know, and, and you know, we do stuff. But why I say this is that sometimes people will say, oh, we should just have more education for people about their dogs, or we should um, have a dog license. And of course, it's great in this situation because North and South, you've had dog licenses for, for many years still. And sometimes think, oh, why do we have a dog license? I hear this particularly in England and that will solve everything. And you, and you know that that doesn't. Um, but the key thing is we're fallen angels. You know, we're not bad people, but, you know, we just sometimes want to, we don't always do the right thing. 
And so these are people like us, like all of us on this call here. I mean, there was one devil there, but I think that was maybe somebody being a wee bit cheeky, um, who actually are not bad people, but sometimes we don't always do the right thing. And yet we've had a test and we've seen leaflets and we know that people die every year for, well, pretty every week from excess speed. And yet we still don't do what we should. And that's because we're human. So I just bring that in mind because sometimes I hear people say, oh, we put up a sign about this or we did that or that. And then, then people just ignored it. Well, you know, that's just people. So how do we do things better and try to make things easier? So like with speed limits, how are we clear about how fast you can go or, or engage? But that's the point I want to make. We're dealing with this is a people management issue and people are infallible. And it's how do we make things incrementally better? So what is it that dog walkers seek if you want to influence where they go and what they do? Again, these are approximations, they vary, but this gives you a, a bit, bit of a clue. A key thing is for daily dog walks around uh, one hour, maybe about 2.7 kilometres long, close to home and away from traffic. And a key thing is that the majority of dog walkers are looking for off-lead exercise. That's not to say that they expect it everywhere, but that most people will be looking for that somewhere. And that can be quite challenging, but that's a reality that we, we need to live with. And you'll know that that's the case anyway, because I've been seeing some of the background stuff and it's saying, oh, we've got an issue with dogs off leads or whatever. People aren't doing it to annoy you. It's because they get some, feel some reward. The impacts might not be great, um, but actually they just feel some reward for doing it. That's just the same as why do some people speed? Because for them at that particular time, that seems an OK thing to do and that they're not kind of aware of the consequences or they've done it lots and it's not been a problem. They also want to go to different coast and countryside places. But the key thing is that dog walkers will avoid conflict if they're given an informed choice. And that's the key thing to remember. Our fallen angels actually don't you know, want to have a, an easy time when they're out. But how do we help them make that choice? And also we know from all that dog walkers aren't in general expecting, you know, a free for all and I want to be able to go everywhere else. But we're looking for actually restrictions and they'll accept those in, in key sensitive places, but also they want accessible alternatives too. So the best management ethos, which I'd hope will, in, uh, I can encourage you to take when you go forward with whatever you're doing after this event, is that instead of just thinking about dealing with the problems, how do we both reduce the problems, but also promote the benefits? And actually you'll get, far more bang for your buck if you like in terms of doing that but also your engagement with visitors with dogs will be better because basically what they're looking for is happy healthy hassle-free dog walks so how do we help them do that because they're not intentionally going out causing problems but sometimes they can cause problems and sometimes the consequences can be horrific for example if we're thinking about livestock worrying a key thing then is to think about uh displacement denial which i think has happened a lot in the past because in the past, we've done things like, and, and I remember this when I was in a local authority, we're very good at putting up signs saying no, aren't we? Like um, no dogs, no dog walking, no, dogs not on the lead will be shot. Even things like this one, these lands are poisoned for the protection of animals. So that's one that came from an um, island. But actually, if you think you've got problems, look at this one in the bottom right hand corner, because clearly this local authority has a problem with alcoholic chain smoking dogs on skateboards. So, you know, it could be a whole lot worse. So just remember that one. Seriously, as I was saying before, sometimes people say, why don't we just use the law and just say no dogs or dogs must always be on the lead and be clear and consistent about it. And if by magic, uh, the dogs will disappear, problem solved. Well, we know that won't work. And actually, it's great talking about this in an island context as well, because actually your legislation is often in theory a lot more powerful than, for example, in England, Scotland and Wales, because you've got general uh, laws about not fouling in any public place. You've got dog licenses and your, your fines are higher. Uh, you brought in compulsory microchipping before it happened in England, Scotland and Wales as well. So there's lots of good stuff in terms of legislation. And yet, you, you know, you're all those of you in Ireland uh, here today because there are still issues. So let's just remember that. The key thing about saying no is that people still want to walk their dogs. They're not just going to magically disappear, not most of them anyway. This is again from an amalgamation of data from a few different sources, but around three quarters will still want to walk their dogs as much so they'll go somewhere else. And the thing is, if you've, for good intentions, say, push them off a beach or an area where there's ground nesting birds, without managing that, you might be displacing them onto farmland or even onto sites which have been previously less visited, uh, but which are sensitive nature conservation. So you may well be shifting the problem to actually somewhere where it has a more of an impact. There's also issues about thinking about people with uh, disabilities and assistance dogs as well, because apart from it, it not being a good thing to, to cause problems for people who already face additional challenges in their lives, but also in terms of legislation and discrimination, that's not a good thing you want to do for anybody, but particularly in the public sector. So displacement is key. 
because um, most dog owners can drive somewhere else or, or walk somewhere else um, and they can do that. And actually, as I was saying, it can increase problems on previously little visited sites. You may think, oh, we've solved our problem because half of our dog walkers have disappeared, but actually where have they gone to? Uh, and also, if you're displacing it onto farmland and other places, you can be displacing it to, to people who have less resource and, and more sensitivities on their land. So that's something to, to bear in mind. And actually, it just can cause it can be uh, just cause more and more problems. It can be quite a vicious circle. So in essence, what I want to get across to you is the need that we need to think about managing demand, because if you're going to try and restrict where walkers with dogs go and what they do, whether that's saying no dogs or dogs on lead, they can still keep coming to your site if their needs are still met. So, for example, if there is an off lead option, they, they may well still come. They could go somewhere else and that might actually be the right situation if you things like um, turns nesting on a beach or something like that. And that might be OK. It depends where else they go. But equally, they could look to practically or politically challenge the restriction, ignore the restrictions, given a like, low likelihood of being caught or fined. Um, and so actually planning for that and helping them avoid conflict and again have these happy, healthy, hassle-free dog walks is the way to go. And it's a nicer way to, to work with people anyway. So how do we do that? How do we make it easier for people to do the right thing? So this is a client, a project in mine in on the south coast in England that I've worked with uh, for about over 10 years now. And just uh, when you've got time, have a look at this, because even just looking at the front page of this, if you're a dog owner, you think, mm, OK, I want to engage with this and that they do a leaflet called Enjoy and Dorset with your dog. All this is funded due to concerns about ground nesting birds. But you can see that front of house that is purely designed to engage with dog walkers, because even if you, you know, your interest is birds, um, Actually, if you want to engage in your audience, you need to engage them in terms of what's important to them. You know, some people might want to know inf more information about birds, but some people might like, you know, I don't hate curlews, but actually I just really just want to walk, have a nice, happy, healthy, hassle-free walk with my dog. And this does brilliant work. And I would say it's one of the leading ones there. So do have a look. And I'm not just saying that because it's one of the, uh, my clients, but it is it internationally you know this is really really good there's also some good practice as well in Ireland that I'll point to in a second too there's also people helping people make good choices about avoiding livestock so this is Brighton and Hove Council there they have an online map on their GIS system where you can actually see where the sheep are grazing because in this city they have little pockets of green space that are being grazed by livestock all the time because it's good for flora and fauna but also because it reduces costs in mowing and they also have an a Twitter feed as well. So if uh, somebody with a dog subscribes to that, they get a message when the sheep are being moved from one place to another. So even before they leave home, they have a really good idea about where they can go. And if they're looking for an off lead dog walk, they, they help them make those good choices. You have some great stuff going on uh, in Ireland as well. I was just picking out these from Northern Ireland. The leaflet for a start in the top right there is great. Just by looking at the leaflet, I can tell you that you're a good few steps ahead because actually there's a picture of somebody with a dog. Uh, sometimes I've seen leaflets and bits and pieces where it's like, oh, we care about birds or livestock or whatever. So there's either a picture of a cow or a sheep or a bar tail godwit or whatever it may be. But you need to engage with your audience first. If they don't want to pick up the leaflet because it doesn't appear to be for them or something that they love, they're not they're not going to do it or far less likely. If you look at the magazines in the supermarket or whatever, if you want a uh, magazine to sell, you stick a picture of a puppy on the front of it. And that because they want people to pick up and manage it. So think about that as well, again, about your audience. And I love this map on the Outmore NI site where you can actually go through and pick out walks and then you can select where dogs are allowed or not allowed. And there's opportunities to, you know, which I think is really, it's helping people make a good choice because once they get to your site, they're probably going to do hope and do what they want to do, even if it doesn't seem that accommodating. So helping people make good choices before they leave home is really, really important and one of the best things you can, you can do. There's things in there that looking at them, um, we can maybe polish and do a little bit more and I'd love to work with you on that. But do be proud of what's already out there because there's some good stuff going on already. Once people get on site, uh, timely advice and signage helps the majority of dog walkers. So that's the angels and fallen angels. Remember that the devils are just going to do their own thing anyway, and you just need to use legal measures if you can. How do we help them do the right thing? Some key things with signage then. Uh, I know people often say, oh, we just need signage that's uh, uh, consistent. Well, you do, but also it needs to be credible and it needs to be clear because if it's just consistently vague, or actually, if it doesn't have any credibility, for example, it says, oh, dogs on leads, but 
that somebody with a dog sees loads of people walking without a lead, then that's not going to work. So I would always say if you're doing any signage, get somebody who's not been involved with the project, that, but who's a bit doggy, uh, for want of a better term, to just look at it. Because in the comfort of your own office or on the phone or on Teams, they will tell you because it's actually really, really hard to write stuff because everybody on this call knows far too much you know, in terms of actually what we're trying to get through to our audience, because we're not trying to communicate with people like us. Yes, we might have a dog, but actually we've got a lot more knowledge. So get somebody else to, to check understanding and meaning. Thinking about no more than maybe three points maximum per sign. And if you've got something that's locally relevant and you cover it or change it or remove it when it's not needed, that's great to do as well. If you're wanting people to avoid where there's ground listing birds or sheep or whatever, suggest an alternative rather than just say don't go here or dogs on the lead or whatever and again doggy imagery is really important and clearly say what you do want people to do rather than what you don't imagine if you're at home and your partner might be saying oh you know don't do that don't do this and you get pretty tired of it really um, or maybe you don't live with me and you may be better behaved um, but uh, whereas if you say actually if you do this that will make me really happy that's far nicer just being told oh don't do that it really ticks me off so again really helpful in terms of that and things with any sort of signage this is a, a sign near the the school on the island where i live this works really well and it's really important because it's about children's safety is that the most effective signage shows where restrictions start and finish so you can see as you're approaching the, the school it goes down to 40 but when you when it's the most sensitive time i.e when children are coming and going going in the morning and evening at lunchtime the lights flash you to let you go even slower and that's got credible, it's consistent, and people know what it means. Whereas if that was 20 all the time, people would start going a bit faster because they think, oh, there's not children here or whatever. And that's the same thing we need to do with signage for, for any visitor. The other key thing as well, you'll see that on the right hand side, is once you get past the sensitive bit, it tells you you can go faster. If you would just have a sign that says on leads or sensitive birds or no dogs, unless you clear about where that restriction finishes, people will make up their own minds about where that may be. Uh, and unless they're a real expert on triple SIs and SPAs and SACs and other designations, they probably won't make particularly good choices. So here we can see examples. This is um, uh, in England with a, a, a well, Forestry Commission as was, and nice to see some of you folks on, on the call today. And this is down in Kent, where actually they're using, as many people do know, a traffic light system to be really clear about where, play, uh, where leads need to be used or there's no dogs, but also offering things like enclosed dog training areas and they were concerned about um, dogs going in ponds where there's not a jack toads. So they provided a pond with easy access where dogs can get in and out cleanly um, so that actually pe dog walkers use that one pond and it leaves the, the invertebrates in the, um, in the other ponds uh, freer from disturbance. But there's lots of bad, it's really easy to do bad signage and just flicking through it here. And I, I can spend a whole couple of hours in a workshop doing this. Just looking at this, some things to think about. Again, really, really well-meaning. Again, there isn't a picture of a dog in it. It's not instantly about dogs. Remembering if somebody turns up at a car park and their dog's excited, they want to be off and away. They're not wanting to read lots and it needs to engage with them. We also know from behavioral psychology that graphic images have a limited effect on the target um, audience because people can often think, oh, that won't happen to me or that's not relevant to me. We know when livestock happening happens, that reality can kick in. Also by just saying, always keep your dog on a lead, unless you're specific about that, it's like, well, everywhere, all the time, or do you just mean when the sheep in this field? Um, and actually it's also not helping people make good choices if they are looking for off lead about where to go. Similarly, this shows a classic system uh, situation I see where you've got one uh, government body. So for example, here the county council are saying, keep dogs under close control on a sign, and another one where the national park saying, uh, keep your dog on a lead and it's lambing and nesting time, but that picture was taken in November. So again, that's two public bodies not helping each other because the units were close control, so that's not on a lead, and it, it's, just not, it's just not a great way to go on. If we can't be clear as professionals about what we want from our visitors, if we can't be clear and consistent between ourselves, how can we expect our visitors to actually know what's wanted? So let's bring up another poll here, and uh, my wonderful assistant, uh, Kerry, will bring up another uh, link in the chat. And this is where we're going to ask people about, here we go. This is just so brilliant, thank you. So I'll ask you this question when we're talking about what we want from people, which of these dogs are under control? So for a dog that's on a lead, is it yes, no, or maybe? 
What about a dog jumping up at a small child? Yes, no, maybe. Quartering heathland, so running around heathland areas in May. Or chasing a grey squirrel up a tree, chasing birds on a beach, pulling branches off trees, or off lead uh, on the path still at the side of the owner. So which of those dogs are under control? Give me a yes, no, or maybe. And we'll see what you come up with there. Brilliant. Look at this. This is just incredible. Thank you, Kerry. And I'm just it also gives me a time to uh, take a sip of water and to check my timing and we're looking good on time, which is great. So brilliant. Wow. This is more exciting than the X Factor, um, apart from the fact that this is still running an X Factor, I don't think is. 23 responses. People are happy to do this a little bit more than admitting as to whether they were um, uh, speeding or not, which is wholly understandable. So uh, there we go. So we'll just have a look at that now. I'm happy to, to close that, Kerry, but just have uh, let me leave it up on the screen so I can have a look. So again, uh, which of these dogs are under control? If it's on the lead, a lot of people saying yes. But what if that dog was still on a lead? Maybe it was a lead of a few meters and then it jumps up at a child. Is that under control still? Shouldn't be happening. What about jumping up at a small child? People uh, very happily say, no, that's not under control. Or quartering Haithland in May, not under control. Similarly with the grey squirrel. Interesting one that, because often people hear lots of messages about grey squirrels being a pest and they need to be exterminated. So, and then they'll think, so why is it a problem for my dog to chase it? Maybe from a conservation perspective, not, but in terms of animal welfare, it's not good. Um, uh, pulling branches off trees. Uh, so it's a dog off lead on the path at the side of the owner. Uh, a good number of people saying that actually that's uh, that's under control, uh, and it's interesting because that's not uh, that's not on the lead. So thank you for that. Let me just put my slides back up now, and thank you for sharing that with me. Because what I'll say to you now is, uh, let's bring up my. We'll talk about under control, but let me suggest to you some other things that are actually done under control. Cycling fast along a public footpath, you can do that under control. You can gallop a horse towards pedestrians, you can do that under control. You see where this is going now. Driving at 40 in a limit, yeah, it may not be responsible, it may be really, really unsafe, but actually, is that car out of control? Probably not. Shooting a bird of prey, you could be actually really well controlled marksman um, or shooter or whatever it is um, and hit the bird, do it perfectly under control, but is it a good thing? You see where this is going? Actually, control doesn't mean anything at all. And actually, if you start talking about control, you end up getting in arguments with, with dog owners because um, you say to them, oh, that dog's not under control and the owner will say, yes, it is. That's really not the point. It's actually what it's doing. For example, uh, with some of the gun dogs that I've trained, we can take them out or particularly things like pointers and stuff that we'll use for bird surveys. We can have them working out on a heathland. Um, but as soon as we want them back, giving the peeps on the whistle, they'll come back straight away or with spaniels or something, particularly gun dogs that like food. So those are under control, they'll come back straight away, but they can be allowed to quarter land and at the wrong time of year in the wrong place, that can be flushing all sorts of ground nesting birds and hares and all sorts of things. So the issue really isn't control, it's actually being specific about what you want. And this is some pe thing people have done for ages, so don't feel hard about it. But I would say to you, move away from under control and actually saying what behavior do you want because things can be done totally under control that are illegal or damaging or whatever so for example this is looking at um some work i did in scotland along with the british horse society there and the kennel club um traditionally you know they said oh keep your dog under close control around horses or whatever whereas this post that was produced a few years ago now we actually wrote it um, because I wanted to say actually what do we want and I say this is somebody who's a, also a horse rider as well. So instead of saying close control we're actually saying keep your dog calm, quiet and at your side around horses. Make up, always make sure your, you and your dog can be seen. That's really important because sometimes people hop behind a hedge if they think a horse is coming so you don't scare it but actually what that means is that you know when the horse gets to the person with the dog then it's even more scary because you, you're very close to it. And equally for horse riders, because there's things for people to do on both sides here, slow down to a walk when passing dogs and walkers and make sure dog walkers can see you approaching. So you see that's not about control. It's actually you need control to do those things, but this is actually what you to do. If you just said, oh, 
uh, dog walkers and horse riders uh, being controlled. That doesn't help you, but this specifically does. Some wording that's used uh, in the dog walking code from Natural England, which is currently being reviewed. Um, this first one, I think, covers so many things and we rarely say it. Um, don't let your dog off the lead unless you keep it in sight and close enough to come back to you on command. Just keeping your dog in sight, we very rarely say that, but actually that's critical because if it's not in sight, then we can know that it isn't under control because you're actually not able to give it any commands because you don't know what it's doing. Another thing is prevent your dog from, and you see the positive there, prevent your dog from approaching horse riders, cyclists, or other people and their dogs uninvited. This project that I worked on with Natural England was trying to really hone down what we wanted in behavioural terms in few in as few words as possible. I'd still like fewer words, and if you've got some better, shorter wording, that would be great too. So let's give you an example and just do this in the chat. So this is a sign um, that some of you on coastal areas um, in North and South, I know the issues when I went to look at Bull Island just outside Dublin where there was issues. And so you see here we're saying shorebird nesting and roosting area. To protect the wildlife for this site, please keep your dog under close control at all times. So just one or two of you, if you can, just type in chat what you think might be some better wording or just have a think about what you've just heard from me. What might be better wording to say rather than keeping your dog under close control at all times? And just type it up. It isn't a poll, but just type in somewhere. Keep your dog close to you at all times. Yeah, because that's good. So thank you, Helen, because that's a good one, because it actually, is, again, we would say, well, what does close mean? Um, and it's good that you didn't mention about a lead, because if your dog's in a lead, if you still go really close to the turns, that can be a problem. Uh, prevent your dog from chasing birds. Brilliant, Jen, that's a good one. Keep your dog on a short lead at all times. You can, but then you can still be walking your dog really close to the turns. We know that dogs are off leads uh, are more likely to put birds to flight, but even still you can get a predator response. Calm and insight at all times. Brilliant, we're seeing lots of behavioural terms come out there. Keep your dog close to you to prevent it, birds on the ground, but then, which is good, but also where do you want the people to go? Keep your dog at your side. This is great. I can see that, I mean, some of you were clearly ahead of the loop already on this, um, but thank you for that. Uh, I'm just aware of time, so let's just move on. Uh, so here's some other examples of mine, but I don't have a I don't have a monopoly on having perfect wording. But here are some other options. So please prevent your dog from making the birds fly away. Um, but because there's lots of things about that and, and it will differ depending on the dog. That's one of the issues as well. Or please prevent your dog from approaching the birds. Again, these need to are best if they're site specific as well. But you can see where this is going that at least these to me are a lot better than just saying close control or control because we're actually if somebody's out and they think oh I was down there and then those birds flew off I know that that shouldn't really have happened and then they can change that behavior you might pro provide some signage or something else um to help steer people so like you know to avoid disturbing the birds please at this time of year please go this way but this is all stuff to help them do the right thing because we're being really clear Another key thing uh, thinking about when we're talking about leads is just remembering the dangers that, um, you know, every year, well, in the UK, three or four people are killed, walkers are killed by being trampled by cattle, and I know there's issues in, um, in Southern Ireland as well. And here this um, farmer uh, was very narrowly spared jail because he didn't do what he, he should have done in terms of making people aware that there was cattle and, and selecting the right sort of cattle for where there was public access. He's still got difficulties because he, he finds it difficult to get uh, third party insurance for his farm now. Um, so some of the wording again, just looking at doing wording better. This is from Nature Scott, which was Scottish Natural Heritage. So here the wording that they were using um, this year was uh, don't allow your dog to approach animals or people uninvited. Where possible, avoid animals, uh, slightly different because the access law is different in Scotland, uh, but release your dog if threatened by cattle. If you're doing any wording about dogs on leads around livestock, it's really, really important to have that release your dog if threatened by cattle message. Certainly signs like these, whilst they can seem really amusing or cutesy, uh, and these are real life ones that I've seen, you know, this is really not what any public or private sector land manager wants to do. Um, because in a way you're, you're recognising uh, that there's a problem and there's this awareness that um, of walkers being killed. A good thing that's been working uh, in Cornwall in southern England, uh, southwest England, is actually if there's been concerns about um, livestock, 
um, offering people an alternative route, either on a separate route or in a different field or just fenced off from cattle by electric fencing really works. Even if people have a right or have always gone one certain way, if it's like, well, I can go this way and actually avoid the cattle, people will do it if we give them that option. We talked about fouling. Um, again, I can do you a whole I can do your whole morning on dog poo, um, which I know sounds delightful. Um, but there is a lot to it. But again, it's all about people management. But here's some of my top tips. Be clear about what you want people to do, when and where. One thing we often don't say is that we'll have posters that will say, oh, you need to pick up dog poo. And then I saw one counselor, the whole list of all these diseases that people would get, uh, you know, or can get from dog poo. And then at the end, it's like, we want you to pick it up. So it's kind of like saying that dog poo is almost like radioactive material. And then we're asking them to pick it up. Much better to say, actually, and it's true, that actually if you pick the poo up as soon as it's come out of the dogs, that's the safest time to pick it up. When it's then been left on the ground or even worse in a bag and got warm and it's given the opportunity for parasite eggs to hatch, that's far worse. And that is really, really helpful for some people if that's the reason they're not picking up. A key thing as well, depending where you are and how your council is, a majority of councils now are really happy and actually find savings by actually saying, bag dog poo can go in with in general litter bins. Again, you need to be clear and you can see some pictures here where it's making it really clear that, that that's OK. Not recycling bins. So that's why we're talking about waste bins. Changing where bins are if you have them uh, can really help. And some work was done to actually have a, when it was a circular walk to, to just say actually the next bin is in 10 minutes or 500 metres or whatever. So people knew if they'd passed the last bin or not, that improved picking up rates as well. There's a key thing to raise awareness in rural areas as well, because there's generally a low level awareness of diseases like neosporosis, which causes uh, abortion in cattle and sarcocystosis and other things like GID that you have, uh, which can cause brain disease and death in sheep. So one of the messages, again, that the dog walking code in England was using, which was always bag and bin your dog's poo wherever you are. You can use any public waste bin or your bin at home. So again, rather than saying, oh, be responsible with your dog's poo, help people know what the right thing is to do. So we've got all this and dealing with problems once they've started, but ideally we'd want to stop problems happening in the first place. And we know this, we know earlier on that around a, a quarter to a third of all homes are going to have a dog in them. So when there's new housing being built, how do we deal with that reality? You know, because if we'd plan for the sewage and we'd plan for where those people are going to go to school, uh, but actually do people think about dogs? Well, it's starting to happen, uh, which, which is great. And this is great because actually if you do it this way, the developers can end up uh, solving the problems in the first place or not preventing the problems from happening rather than hard pressed local authority budgets doing so or adjacent farmers having to suffer because of it too. Because we know, as I was saying, where are new residents going to walk their dogs? And there's a booklet here which you can access online and Orni can have it as well uh, that I wrote a number of years ago, 2013. Blimey, that uh, sounds ages ago. But how do we plan for dog ownership in new developments? Because if you built all these houses and then said, oh, you can't, we know that it's very difficult to ban people from having dogs in houses anyway, in a legal sense. So actually then when you start thinking about where are these people going to get those daily one hour walks, you can start planning in green space in and around where the development is. That might be uh, funding for adjacent um, green spaces, for example, if there's some public forestry or a beach or whatever like that. And in some cases, depending how you pl the planning authority is, for example, to the west of London, there, there's a levy of £7,000 per home on average being levied um, so that actually these green spaces can be provided and maintained in the future so that people are then not walking their dogs on really sensitive special protection area heathlands. Um, and it can work really, really well. Uh, in um, So there it was underpinned by EU law. And of course, for those of you in the south, that, that's still there. Still in place uh, elsewhere in, uh, in British Isles, but who knows where that's going to go. But you can also just go to dogfriendlyhousing.org.uk and download that document. So here's just some examples. This is a 46 acre farm, some uh, whole, whole load of new housing being built nearby. So actually the developers all got together. Uh, a new fa uh, This farm was built up and made into a really good bit of green space. This is early on, just as the, the trees were starting to, uh, to grow. But if you want to make some of your green spaces which are less sensitive, um, to attract more dog walkers to those because you don't you want them to avoid places that are sensitive nature conservation or whatever just improving the fencing can really work and again this is something that developers have funded this is uh, down in hampshire 
but also in some cases as well this is some of the stuff being done like dog washes being provided those are done at um, zero cost that the firm puts those in and, and you, you pay to use them but actually dog friendly cafes and um, drinking bowls and all this sort of thing have been really good so again increasing income and reducing um, costs Dog walking fields are really popular as well, and there's a slide there giving you a bit of an overview. But when they're in the private sector, they're managed as a limit to number of people who can use them at a time. But in the private sector, I would say just in the public sector, just have a word, because if it's a bit of a free for all, there's a number of management uh, restrictions and, and liabilities that you need to think about, because you can end up attracting the most badly behaved dogs to all one area. So just have a, have a think about that and we can talk about it a bit more in the Q&A. So to look at bringing things towards a, a close, if you like, um, we need to think holistically about this. If you just react to the fact that there's, and it's easy to do if a, a, an animal's been injured or attacked by a dog, or you've just trodden in dog poo, or you see some uh, turns being flushed from the nest, whatever it may be, it's easy to react. But a key thing to remember, and again, this can help with your funding, is this concept that's called One Health. So this is where we're saying that the health of people is dependent on the health of the environment and the health of animals, whether they're pets or whether they're farm animals or wild animals, is all intertwined. And there's this, it's an international initiative called One Health. Um, I'm aware of the time, so I'll probably just stick on, skip over this uh, poll because I'm really keen we have Q and A's. But what that was going to explore was actually what are dog owners most influenced by? Because often we can think that if we put a sign up that says, oh, this is by order, or this is what the law says, or this is what the ranger says, or all these sort of things, we would like to think that's great. But actually, visitors with dogs are most influenced by people like them. And that's just because, again, it's a people management issue. We're all influenced by people like us, mostly. So dog owners, we know from a lot of the research, are most influenced by what they see other dog walkers doing and where they go, and also other canine professionals like vets, dog groomers, vet nurses, uh, their dog trainer, that sort of thing. Um, this report is, is one of them that picked up on that. So the key thing then is that actually if you're wanting to do stuff, think about that relationship uh, with the dog owning community because they're the best people to be advocates for you in terms of influencing other dog owners. So it might be that you think you want to ball somebody out straight away for not doing something, but actually if they say, oh, go away and say to another dog walker, oh, I didn't realise what I was doing was a problem, but the ranger was really nice uh, and I'm just going to do something differently. You're making that advocacy work really, really well. So just have a think about that and think about how you engage with that canine community. And that could also be through social media as well. Some really innovative approaches that have gone on. In some cases, this Brighton and Hove Council, they're using dog walkers to actually keep a lookout for their conservation grazing sheep and to report them if, if they get stuck or the water is low in them. Commercial dog walkers, again, they can see a value in actually being a source of really good information and they can be a really good way of getting information out to their clients. So rather than just seeing them as a problem, actually we know from some workshops I did in Scotland that they're really open to actually helping their business, but by being good and responsible and seen to be green. So in summary then, it's been a whirlwind trip um, through it and I hope, uh, hopefully that means that you're still all awake and I can see in the chat that you are. The key thing I'd want you to think about, whatever you're doing, is actually make it easier for them to do the right thing. Promote the good while reducing the bad and try to manage that demand rather than suppressing it. Also foster the political and commercial opportunities which are out there. Rather than just seeing it as being a problem, there's opportunities to actually help your sites, get money from developers or that sort of thing. Certainly plan for dogs in new housing and actually make sure that there's integration between the ranger service and the dog warden and the planners and all these sorts of things. Um, for example, this picture is just showing a designated swim area for dogs that was put in. The idea of that was just to stop dogs going in and out of the whole riverbank because it was causing, causing sedimentation, which wasn't good for fish. Provide some people with a really good place for their dogs to go in and out. You're actually limiting the impact there. So just finally, you might be thinking, oh, um, uh, we could do this, Steve, or what that. I'm kept really busy, so I don't need to do any, any hard sell with you. But how I tend to work with people, if you want to do some more, is actually I just like help people find their own solutions. I'm not there to deliver a one-off package to do it all because it needs to be really locally relevant. But if you want to work with me to pick up um, things about, you know, using international best practice on your site, that's great. You might think after this you want some more training events or you might want an audit doing of your site from a third party perspective to help you think about what you could change. 
that's the sort of stuff I do. I'm kept really, really busy, even more so than COVID. So just have that discussion. But it might be that you want to or need to develop something else for you. And that's it. Um, pretty much on time, which is great, um, Elizabeth. As I say, you can tell I'm not lacking in passion for this subject, nor is there any doubt that there's things that you can do to help life better for you, for your communities, for livestock, wildlife, and for people who love or even hate dogs. So thank you very much and over to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Steve. I think um, I speak for everybody here by saying that we can listen to you all day on this topic. So thank you very much. Um, what I would encourage you to do now is to start throwing some discussion points, questions into the chat pane, because we've got 15 minutes um, before we come to Q&A session. Um, and we've got three people who are going to provide some case studies. Um, and these are all volunteers. We didn't have to go out and twist any arms here. So the first person I'm going to come to is Trisha Dean. Um, Trisha Dean is the European Innovation Partnership Project Manager um, for Ireland's highest mountain. And I think that mountain, Trisha, has got livestock, lots of livestock on it, so you've got lots of challenges. So you can share what you've been doing and any lessons learnt. Absolutely. I hope my screen will actually share properly now, Elizabeth. So we'll, uh, we'll give it a go. Okay, so are you seeing that, guys? Yes, we are. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And I don't know what people are going to make of this because it's a little bit different to what Stephen had to say. And we do not hate dogs. I want to put that on record. We actually love dogs down here as well. But we have, we're facing some very unusual challenges. So Stephen gave us a lot to think about there. And uh, there's no doubt about it. There's numerous benefits actually to having dogs and for health and everything else. There's no doubt about that. So for the last number of years, we've been working on two initiatives. The first one was the McGillicuddy Reeks Mountain Access Project, and that's all about protecting, managing, and we developed developing the land here that is the McGillicuddy Reeks. And the second project then was more recent, started back in 2019, was the European Innovation Partnership Project. It's one of a number of that are operating the country, and it is all on privately owned land. Okay, so a little bit of context for you guys, for people that don't know the McGillicuddy Reeks from outside of the, the area. So we have huge numbers here accessing the land. So in 2018, just under 240,000 recreational visitors. Um, it's all privately owned land. Every single bit of it is privately owned land. It is grazed by livestock. Recently, as part of the European Innovation Partnership Project, we've brought on cattle, but it's predominantly uh, sheep. Um, so, and it's all a special area of conservation, all SAC. So yeah, there you go, guys. It's a challenging terrain. So I suppose when we would look at this from um, a dog perspective or a dog owner's perspective, we'd say, well, it's not land that is suitable to bring your dog on. It's quite challenging to walk it uh, aside from trying to hold on and manage a dog. OK, so what we come across and sorry now about the graphic nature of some of these photographs, but this is what we are coming a lot across. Well, we had been coming across this a lot. Trisha, so a lot sorry, um, yeah. we're just having problems with your slide. Can you? Um, with my sound? The slide show. So at the minute we're just seeing it um, as a a normal sort of PowerPoint in edit mode. Oh, OK, sorry. One second. I'll go back into it again. So I probably just means um, just uh, and just a slideshow. Running ahead, so am I a bit. So I have to stop sharing and share again, do I? Yes, if you do that and then if you hit F5. OK, sorry about that now. You're OK. The good fun of technology, eh, guys. <laughs> OK. OK, F5, is it? Yes, F5. Or if you go down to the bottom right hand side, there's one called slideshow, a little icon. There we go. Is that coming up now? Yes, it seems to be. Yep. Yeah, perfect. perfect. OK, perfect. so I might have to go back so to the previous slide, maybe if you probably missed that. Yeah, OK, so you're seeing that now? Yes, we are. Yeah, perfect. Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> so there you go, guys. That's just to give you a bit of context for people that haven't been to the McGillicuddy Reeks or haven't wouldn't be familiar with it. So yeah, that's just what I'm saying, basically, that it is all privately owned land. 
So the next slide now, there's a few graphic pictures here, but what we would have been getting, and thank God now for the last two and three years, this is definitely, um, this hasn't been such an issue, thank God, and I'm touching wood as I say that as numbers of dog owners have increased. So a lot of people, the farmers themselves think it's down to respect. A lot of people do not believe that the land can be privately owned. They find it very hard to accept that the mountains are privately, are privately owned and we're very close to Killarney National Park. So a lot of people believe that the mountains are part of the National Park. And then there's probably a sense of entitlement from people and they'd say, well, I'm local. You know, you're not going to stop me. Who's going to stop me? You know, I can do what I want. And then there's another challenge, I suppose, that presents itself, that people are coming from other jurisdictions where dogs are allowed under control. And this is kind of a, a challenge as well when they come here. So what we feel is the most important part to deal with this, um, and it is what Stephen said, it's about education, awareness and positive engagement. So instead of going around saying no, 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 it is a lot of it is education. Um, so what we've done in this regard is we introduced a system of landowner rangers where the landowners would be there themselves. And it's mostly to actually just explain why dogs are not welcome in the Miguel Cuddy Weeks. It is down to that six to seven hours difficult terrain. You don't want your poor little dog walking in that terrain. Um, and it's, it's even looking at supporting farmers to maybe set up dog runs and things like that and offer all their alternatives. So the landowner rangers are there at the weekends and they do a lot of engagement. So instead of coming up to somebody and giving out and saying, why are you bringing your dog? Your dog's not welcome here. We actually the, the landowner rangers carry out surveys and then you engage in the conversation you see i noticed you bring your dog um unfortunately you can't bring your dog here because there are livestock grazing here all of the time but you can go here instead and we think that is very very important because like it's all special area conservation you could try and put that on signage but a lot of the public we know will not read signage they just want to go for their walk uh, and you could be trying to explain about the heathland and the, the breeding birds the nesting birds and um, sheep and cattle but again, it's just saying, look, guys, not today, but these are the alternatives nearby, locally, you can go there instead. And we think that is the best way to go about it, positive engagement. That is the signage, and it is very clear, it's very concise, um, you're entering private property. It is about respecting the landowners, so no dogs. So there's a number of those signs. And so thankfully, and I'll touch wood as I say that, um, thankfully, that is working at the moment. But it is about having other alternative options because we recognise the need for people to go somewhere safely with their dogs and enjoy their experience while they're out. So it's about the carrot and stick. So that's what they do. The rangers, they would say, unfortunately, you can't be here, but this is where you can go in the state. OK, um, but that is a challenge having the different jurisdictions. So we do need to we feel we're very strong that we need to be all on the same page. And there needs to be a consistent message going out. And it's about having an, a, probably an awareness campaign again, because um, the people that know, know, but it's the people that, are, that don't know, it's very hard to engage with those people, you know. So uh, that's it. So I was told I had five minutes. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulty there, but uh, that's all I have to say in it, guys. It's a, it's a very, very different approach to Stevens, we know, but um, it's, uh, you know, something to be considered, I suppose, at the same point. Thank you very much, Tricia. Um, I think that will lead to some interesting discussion later on. No um, doubt. <laughs> but I, I think for, for now, we will head east um, towards the Dublin Mountains. And Clodagh, do you want to come on screen and try to share your slides? Um, Clodagh's going to give a brief case study on what they are doing with culture in the Dublin Mountains. Okay. Um, so, so I work as their recreation manager with the Dublin Mountains Partnership and so what I'm going to talk to you about is some work that we're doing on a walking trail in the Dublin Mountains. It's the Ferry Castle Walking Loop. This is a five kilometre loop um, in the Dublin Mountains. About 50% of it is through forest coming up from Ticknock Car Park and then 50% of it is through areas of Quilcha owned um, land that's heathland. Then it goes through an area where there's common age and then an area where we have enclosed and unenclosed farmland. So um, Ticknock is um, 
go to visit recreation site. So from 2019, there was would have been 233,000 visitors. 2020, it was up around 321,000. And then to the end of September, we're looking at 278,000 visitors. So the Ferry Castle Loop, it's five kilometers. It's, it's a very popular walking route. Um, and because I suppose of those, um, the land that is coming through, um, we have had issues. So there have been sheep attacks by dogs on, a jo on lands adjoining the trail. And um, so that's in the area that was actually enclosed farmland. And we've met those landowners and we've talked to them about the impact that it's having on them. And we've tried to put in measures to, um, to assist them and to um, yeah, to assist them with that. There's also, um, this is heath habitat and there's some blanket bog up there as well. And there's red grouse there, there's skylarks, there's meadow pickets. So we're looking at ground nesting bird habitat there. Um, we've also had complaints, um, we're dealing with complaints from other recreational users and people with dogs as well about the impact of, um, of interactions that they've had um, with dogs. And I suppose a thing is, this I suppose, um, Stephen talked about this as effectual control. So that's the Control of Dogs Act. So um, that's what does that mean? And uh, we do have an assigned though. Um, so what does that mean? And what do land um, dog owners believe? And we have um, issues with commercial, some issues with commercial dog um, walkers and some with dog poo as well, but I'm not going to get into that. And um, just so that you know, Fairy Castle is a Neolithic um, tomb. So that's a picture of Fairy Castle in, in the background there, and you're looking down in Stockland Bay. So um, what we've done is we've um, put in these what we're calling baffle gates and we're defining that beyond this point that dogs need to be on a lead because this is the area that leads to um, to this farmland and heath habitat where there could be sheep or ground nesting birds. So Gulcha um, has implement critic bylaws, they reflect the national legislation, which is the Control of Dogs Act, which is that dogs need to be under effectual control. And then there's different guidance um, in terms of restricted breeds. But as a landowner, we can delineate an area where we're saying that dogs need to be on these. So this is, we have these battle gates on all routes leading to this open heat habitat and farmland. So, um, so this is a bit of our um, incarnation of our signs, or the dog of our signs. So, you can see we started off with this. Um, so, yeah, the dogs and leads respect the uplands, livestock may be present. So that's very green and nice, but there is clearly a picture of a dog and lead. And then we move to making it stand out more. And some of this is coming from um, working, I suppose, or talking to the Irish Farmers Association and the adjoining landowners. And that's where we came up with this red sign. And this is also working with um, various closely with the creature and especially very coach the um the forest manager there so during covid um one of the lockdowns that we had two kilometer restriction so there was definitely um because i could break um, because i was allowed to get up there uh, for work um, i could see that definitely that you could the red grass are very evident the skylarks and the meadow papers are very evident so we put up this sign just to let people know so now i've learned since then but if you want to have people have the dog on the lead that you need to have a picture of that but we did put up this sign um just to let people know that um what was going on up there um, so then what we did and um, this year as well we started from the end of february we started to do to monitor our car parks essentially um as we came out of different lockdowns came in and out of them to see um, because there was an increase in demand for our car park spaces but we started from the end of february to do a dog patrol in this um the half of the ferry castle loop so this is the upland part of that ferry castle loop um beyond the battle gates so this was two um cruelty forest workers on a sunday walking that upland area so they're wearing high vis vests the two guys they're really nice they're really friendly and they they were engaging with um the public and they're, they're still doing that they did it on sunday as well so um but it happened that first weekend that they um that they did that patrol there was a dog attack on sheep and um, so it's so going to be put up this sign. Um, it was actually in a different area to Ferry Castle Loop, but it was uh, in in the general um, in the general area. So we put up this sign, which is a bit hard hitting, but um, but that's I suppose we reacted to to what had happened, and we put up the contact numbers. So that sign has. Um, yeah, so that's a sign we had for a while, and um, there is a picture of a dog on the lead. And um, so I suppose 
Oh, um, so we, I suppose this isn't statistically, there's no statistics on this, but this is just um, what's been happening. So um, so this is between the end, the middle of May and the start of September. So the guys, um, they just keep a record of how many dogs they saw, how many were off lead, and then then what else was happening? So we're getting a pattern now that when people see the guys coming, they put their dogs in the lead. Um, the majority of people put their dogs in the lead when they're asked to do it. Um, up until this point, we had one refusal and it was a puppy. And then we did have people that were coming up and they didn't have leads at all. Since then, um, we've had a couple of um, incidents where the guys were just completely ignored. Um, but we're averaging 54% um, of dogs off lead in an area where we've asked people to have their dogs in the lead. Um, and I suppose. Yes, we're asking people and we've defined an area. Um, Quilch staff don't have the authority to insist that somebody puts their dog on a lead. Um, we can only ask. Um, so Quilch bylaws are actually implemented by the Gardaí. So um, this is our new incarnation of our sign. So we just put up these up two weeks ago. So this is a new sign that we put up on to Baffle Gate. So, um, so we're trying, I suppose, I don't know, are we trying to be more subtle? We're trying to, um, that you do need to be put your dog on a lead, but these are the reasons that there's sheep, there's, um, and there's red breasts um, there. And I suppose our intention is that we would, that this area is designated um, for dogs on lead all year round, um, because we don't know when the sheep are going to be there and red grass are ground nesting there, although they can fly there and the rest. So this, so that's, that's our intention. We have also created this sign as well, which we've put up in our car parks now, because this, at the moment, this is the culture policy that it's the following control of dogs act, so dogs under effectual control at all times, and that's the control of dogs act. So you can see in the image um, that we have a dog on a lead, but also a dog to heal, and then you've got, I suppose, again, the reasons why. Um, so this one is a work in progress. The guys have said that over the last two weekends since those signs are up, but this sign in particular, um, there was no change, that there was no difference in, um, no discernible difference in more dogs being on lead than not. Um, so I suppose the other thing um, that we have done is, and this is actually up in that area, so you really, this is the Fairy Castle Loop, and you can see to the left there that some of the unenclosed farmland, and then you can see the fence line in the background, so that's where the enclosed farmland is. So what we have done is we had Enda Mullen, who is a senior dog trainer with um, the DSPCA, and she also works here in National Parks and Wildlife. She volunteered um, to do a dog training walk with us um, two years ago, um, and it was amazing. It was definitely eye-opening for me, but we did it in this area, and I suppose those are the kind of things that we're looking at as well. We also have dog-friendly walks. Um, so those are the kind of measures that we're taking. It's very much a work in progress, but um, yeah, that's us. That's what we're up to. Thank you very much, Cluda. Um, some great examples there, and you can see that as organisations we're having to, to learn on our feet almost with this as well, and to see what works and what doesn't. So thank you for sharing that. Um, for our final case study before we move on to q and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Kerry, who's going to share a couple of examples of um, short videos that we've done um, on issues around dogs as part of the Right Side of Outside campaign. So over to you, Kerry. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> so uh, a lot of you from Northern Ireland will, will be familiar with, with the campaign that we've been running. So Outdoor Recreation and I have been running a campaign from around March, April this year based on responsible use of the outdoors. Um, and we have called that campaign the right side of outside. So it's encouraging um, people to you know stay on the right side, do everything correctly and and educate them on on you know what what's the right thing to do. So obviously with lockdown, we noticed that a lot of people, because they'd lost out on a lot of their leisure activities, activities they were spending a lot more time outdoors um, and obviously that leads to issues that that come up um, so uh, we developed a series of six or seven videos to educate the new visitor and the new user so obviously you know there are people out there that are very familiar with how to look after the outdoors and how to do everything correctly with their dogs etc um, but some people you know who aren't as familiar who maybe got a dog over lockdown and you know they're new to to looking after them don't know the protocols and don't know what to do so 
we had to think really you know cleverly and we worked with a lot of stakeholders in the steering group to think what was the best way of doing that so we developed a series of videos um which are in kind of they've been released sporadically throughout the summer just as issues were coming up and through so um the first one we shared um features a comedian Shane Todd um so he's really funny and just you know drives the message about um lifting dog poo home and then the second one, we kind of, we threw it on its head a bit. We took out the comedy um, and we looked at the more serious issue of livestock. Um, so it's interesting that the one campaign having a series of videos can, um, you know, have different elements to them and, and different ways of, of spotlighting that. So I will just quickly show you both of those videos and you can let me know what you think after. Um, and the the livestock one you're getting a, a world exclusive on that one um because it hasn't been released yet but i will get that up for you now here we go twenty four carat McGoldrick here in the holiest of woods Hollywood Guys, I think we can all agree dog mess is a little bit like the Hooli Lance. It's a real problem. And I'm here to end this abomination once and for all. Dog mess that is not not the Hooli Lance. Although if we can if we can do something, you know, do something we will something about it, you know, I don't know what, but we should do both. You need a shovel for that one? <laughs> Fair play anyway, mate. What are you feeding that thing anyway, Stu and Stout? Oh, you dirty wee beast. Oh, I'm the dog. Oh, mate! Yeah, yeah, you do see it, mate, you do see it. Well, I don't care if you're 87, you're over down there, like, 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 move, like, move far. Yeah, mate, you try and tie that to a tree again, I'll give you a 4D one to the loof. What? Nothing. So, folks, the message from North Downs Finest is for God's sake, take it home with you. Pick up after your pooch. And this is North Down, so obviously that goes for more extravagant animals. You'd have out for a dander as well. You know, flamingos, cheetahs, peacock, duckbill platypus, doo-doo, velociraptor. So that's Shane's, um, and this is the one about dog worrying. What happened to that sheep? Thank you very much, um, Kerry, Cloda and Trisha. I have to say, whenever Kerry showed me that world exclusive of the, the dog we're in one yesterday, I actually had a real lump in my throat afterwards. And um, we're going to move to Q&A time. So I maybe ask Stephen if you could put your camera on. But everybody, if you want to put your camera on, I think that just makes this part of the, the webinar feel a bit more informal. And like we're just about to have a bit of a chat over a cup of tea now about what we've just heard. So. Feel free to um, raise your virtual hand and we'll be able to come to you. Um, really, this is just a place for us to discuss some of the issues. Um, I don't think anybody is here coming from um, a perspective of knowing it all and feeling that we have the right approach completely. Um, so let's you know, discuss things in that spirit. 
And I think, you know, it's really good just to be able to share experience and best practice with other people. So let me come to Shona and Jenkins first. I think you've got your hand up. Hi, yeah. I just wondered if anyone um, with like social media being so influential nowadays, if anyone had any sort of um, positive stories about social media campaigns or negative stories or just any advice either way. Kerry, do you want to give some yeah. indication of our engagement through the right side of outside? Because that's been completely on social media. Like these videos have not been developed for television. It's been all for social media channels. So can you give any indication of engagement with the new visitor? And you're on mute, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I say I'll just I'll just quickly share um, a presentation that Bev had done previously for another um, webinar. So that was the impact today, and that was for a webinar that we did back in August. So the video views have skyrocketed since then. Um, you know, we've reached far more than this number now on social media, loads of website views, loads of newspaper articles, and we find that from speaking to um, you know some of the outdoor areas that their their rates of of dog fouling and and bad behaviour of of people in general has has gone down. So it definitely helps you know having a marketing campaign and a strong campaign where we consolidated different stakeholders, different groups, you know, and we really focused on. I mean, look, there's so many issues we could have talked about and. There's so many sub issues that we could have, you know, dogs alone. There's so many different issues, but we really pin down what what is the new user going to need to know about, and that's what we find really worked um, for that campaign. Um, so yeah, we've we've had huge success from the right side of outside campaign, and we've just finished phase one. So hopefully, we'll be launching into phase two shortly. We'll we'll kind of take take some of the things that maybe need a bit more work still, um, and look more into those or or touch on some new issues that haven't been talked about before. I think it shows um, the importance of maybe trying some more edgy campaigns. Um, so that's been funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. But you know, but we've been very keen to keep government logos off it because we want you know this to be seen as something that people can like and share without seeming to be politicising it. Stephen G, have you seen any great examples of social media campaigns or that has worked really well? Yeah, I mean, the, it, it's a very popular way of doing it. And um, so it's certainly something to have in the armory. The, the key thing I would say is be really, really clear about who you want to market, your, your sort of market segmentation, you know, because we talked about the, the angels, devils and the, and the fallen angels. And then even that's a start because sometimes I've seen campaigns done targeted a, a minority who are not going to respond in that way. Whereas if it's the people who are just well intentioned, but badly informed, that can be good. Um, one that worked particularly well that was done as a partnership that I was working on with Police Scotland and Scottish Natural Heritage as was uh, and Quality Meet Scotland was about livestock worrying but there the key issue we know from and this applies certainly the work in England and Wales I don't have the figures for Ireland that around half of all livestock attacks are coming from free ranging dogs so ones that are actually escaping from people's homes and maybe one dog doing that two or three times a week can seem like a big problem and we can instinctively say oh we need to put posters up for, for walkers and stuff but actually until you've asked that question like why is it happening and who do you want to target and um, that can be all a miss so actually in terms of that being done it was actually not done on a recreation basis but just in terms of targeting for dog ownership and that's one of the key things i would always say whatever you're doing is actually asking why is it happening because unless you're sure about that then your interventions you, you could be doing the, you know the wrong thing for the right reasons if you like hmm. and do you have any tips just sort of leading on from that about how landowners land managers can engage with the canine community so how do they understand you know the, the root of the problems essentially yeah i mean again looking at working through the canine community i know one uh, farmer in in norfolk so in eastern england there has been a real turnaround because they were having lots of problems with um, uh, attacks in their livestock and so both visiting dogs and ones escaping from nearby homes and actually they um, thought okay so they put in a, a live uh, one of these dog walking fields and managed it and they've uh, stopped the problem uh, in terms of the livestock worm, but also made their least prof profitable field into the most profitable one and and of course once you start seeing people as customers and i think this is an, another thing to remember that you know 
all the, the parts of the British Isles produce some fantastic um, local produce, that these people when we're speaking to them are also consumers for that. So in terms of we want them to go away and say, actually, yeah, that person helped me with my dog. I realised there was something wrong, but actually they really care passionately about their sheep or their cattle or whatever. Um, if, if they just go away and think, you know, well, that was the archetypal grumpy farmer who may be grumpy for very, very good reasons, I hasten to add, that's not going to help. So it's thinking about, I would say more generally, about how you want that person to feel after they've engaged with your sign um, or, or speaking to you. And it was great to hear both of those people at last, all the talks talking about um, offering alternatives because that's the key thing. It's like, OK, we won't do it here because they're sheep, but, but where do I go? And that is a very different narrative. Um, but certainly the, um, the things that Nature Scott had done are really good. If you look on their website, they, one thing they've done as well is that they, well, I set up for them uh, a, a URL, which was just the dog.org.uk, because um, then that's easy to remember if you're doing media interviews and stuff, whereas if it's like, oh, it's the, the Scott Gov and then this subdomain and that, it doesn't really work. And actually just the dog sounds nice and like there's something there for you rather than, oh, this is all about people who are passionate about birds or seals or whatever it may be. Excellent, thank you. There's lots of questions flying in, which is great. I'm going to come to Rotary next if you want to put on your camera um, and then we'll come back to some of the questions that are in the chat. Um, but Rotary, do you want to ask your question? Because you've got your hand up. Um, maybe he's popped out to put on the kettle. Um, I've got come to um, a question. Nilda, you've got your, your physical hand up. Do you want to come in? Yes, I, I, I don't know how to do this chat thing. I just wanted to ask a question. We have an awful lot of problems down here with sheep worrying up on the, the hillsides. Um, is it possible that we can, on our, our website and on our Facebook page, um, put a link up of those videos that you just uh, showed us to try and raise awareness? to see to people might to take a, um, an idea of what, what their, their recklessness is doing. Absolutely. Kerry, are you able to give some instruction about how other landowners can get involved with the Right Side of Outside campaign? And you're on mute, sorry. Yes, <laughs> again. Um, yeah, if you drop me an email, um, I yeah, can definitely yeah. put you in touch with, um, you know, our side of things. Um, I'm sure sure we can kind of share share bits and pieces and, and you know, get get more people involved, definitely for phase two. So, yeah, I'll drop my email address in the in the chat pane there. I think I think Nuna, you're having problems seeing the chat pane. So my email address will be up on the screen at the end of the webinar. So okay. take a look at that, and then you can use that and I'll put it on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a question here for for Tricia from Fiona, um, who asks about the landowner rangers. Um, so are they uh, volunteers? Or are they paid? Um, are they the landowners themselves? And do you think this has more effect than the threat of dog wardens, fines, etc? Yeah, so they are actually paid and um, it's not always the farmers themselves. Uh, the farmers can actually nominate people to be the rangers on their behalf. So if they don't have time, because obviously a lot of the farmers now have off farm employment, so they wouldn't always be available themselves. So predominantly, like I said, they're there at the weekend, so they are actually paid. Now they're not paid a lot of money, they're just paid on the hours that they're there. So obviously if the day is bad, you know, there's not a lot of visitors out, you know, there's no point to somebody standing around with the rain waiting for an influx of people to come along. Um, so yeah, they are actually paid. It is, it's, it's much stronger that it's somebody that's from the local area, living in the local area, there's no doubt about that. Um, and again, I suppose they can advise on other things as well, not just why dogs aren't welcome on the mountain in the middle of the weeks, they can say, look, have you checked the weather forecast it's a nice day down here but it's actually quite blustery up there today or they can advise them that you know those shoes might not be the best things to be wearing on the mountain because they're the common things we see you know so it's not just but i suppose it softens the approach to say i'd like a quick minute of your time to do a quick survey with you so you're not immediately going in negative 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 you know you're kind of saying hi there can i have two minutes of your time just to ask you a quick couple of questions so you're, you're engaging them straight away in a positive manner and then you're going on to explain yourself a little bit more oh, you probably don't realise, you know, or if it's local person kind of say, lads, look, you know yourselves now, there's sheep out here. We want to maintain the goodwill of the landowners because we depend on the goodwill of the landowners for access. So again, please, guys, just head away somewhere else and you can give the other options. So, yeah, definitely it, it's far stronger. We don't have dog wardens as such doing anything for us on the mountain because it's privately owned land. 
So I suppose the local authorities are kind of saying, it's not really our problem, guys. We have enough to be dealing with, you know, besides kind of trying to manage uh, like privately owned land as well. So that is challenging. Now we are investigating at the moment if bylaws are actually required, because unfortunately we won't be around here forever on the EIP project. And um, so we want a rangers in place forever. And um, so I suppose that's something we will be looking at because we know that if people think they're not going to get caught doing something, chances are they're going to try doing it, you know, so there has to be some level of, and I don't want to use the word enforcement because that makes sound like right <laughs> army personnel altogether, but you do need some level of, of enforcement, you know, um, and that is the challenge with working with such a vast area because we're talking about an area that's just under 10,000 hectares, you know, and um, so like, again, you have to, everyone has to be on the same page because there's no point saying, oh, we'll allow this person with a dog and then not allowing the person with the next dog up, you know. Um, so again, like I said, it's more about the positive engagement and giving those options um, because it was probably the most contentious issue for the farmers when we actually established the forum, what was going to be done about the, the dogs chasing sheep because it was an ongoing thing. And you'll still have people and it goes that goes down to the ongoing need for the awareness. And the videos that you've done are absolutely powerful. I mean, the, the one on, on Fair Play, you guys, I can't wear to share that out on our own website and everything else because it's so clear. Because you still have people saying, well, my dog chased the sheep, but they didn't bite the sheep. You know, so they still don't get the whole kind of, you know, impact of what the dog has just done. And I've seen it myself. But like I said, thank God. And I'm going to rub my desk here, guys. Touch wood. We haven't had any incidences in the last two years, you know, thankfully. But again, I think that's down to just it's more of a, a positive rather than don't do this and don't do that. You are giving the, the options. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time, so so we're drawing towards a close soon. I know that um, Steve's in no rush to head off, so if people want to hang on afterwards, we can keep discussing this. There is a question in from, from Jen Lynch who asks about um, managing dog access and accommodation lands. I know, Tricia, you've obviously given an example of the approach that ha that's had to be taken there. Are, is there other examples that could be given or, Steve, could you give sort of um, a good practice example of, of managing common land and dog access? Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's very context specific because, for example, in um, uh, England, Wales and Scotland, you'll see examples there. But then even though that's private land, privately owned land for the very most part, the, the statutory rights of access as well. The key thing actually is a lot of what Trisha was saying that actually if you're wanting to say no is actually to give people an alternative and also to have that information because for example if somebody's thought seen all these beautiful pictures uh, of Ireland and think right that's where I'm going to buy my holiday cottage and there's beautiful walks like I see elsewhere and they've booked that cottage and they've come with their dog and then they're committed to that uh, and actually then it's managing that expectation because then if they find there's, they can't do as much as they might then that can be really difficult. So making sure there's that good information to help people make good choices about the, what, where they are. It might be like a year round thing with sheep or it may be something where there's seasonal stuff in terms of overwintering or ground nesting birds, that sort of thing. Um, but also being really clear and also where the sheep start and shots stop. Um, if you've got co compartmentalised grazing, which um, on McGillicuddy's Reeks, I don't think you have, but Trish can update. If there's actually a way that you can be clear, uh, I know on the ferry grain you say you didn't know where they were, but certainly where landowners have taken up and put down signage when livestock's appeared and disappeared, then that has worked really well. Or it's like the sheep are here at the moment, so if you don't want to avoid them, go this way or vice versa. But it's just been really clear about that. Uh, and if the sheep are there all the time, then just really say it, but make sure that the signage, if, if, if you can, and it was great to hear what Trisha said, offers an alternative because at the end of the day, they're still going to want to walk their dog. So do you actually make it more likely that they'll ignore the sign hoping they won't get seen? Or do they think actually if I do this other alternative, then I can have a clear conscience and have a really nice time? Thanks, Steve. Helen, can I come to you? I think this may be the last question that we'll take during this formal part of the webinar and I'll draw that close, but if people want to hang on afterwards, you can certainly do that for a few more moments. So over to you, Helen. OK, thanks. Look, it's all been really, really interesting and I think particularly um, showing the value of people on the ground and the need for education and the, the positive approach. It's really good, um, but um, we're currently in the process of developing a national outdoor recreation strand, national outdoor recreation strategy for the Republic of Ireland. 
And one of the things I've taken from the presentation is the importance of having places for people to go. So I think that's something we need to take note of. But my question, Stephen, is around, are there things we can do at a national level to build a culture of more responsible dog ownership? Um, do you have any thoughts or examples in that regard? Yeah, and, and to start with, I would just, I would say, be clearer if, if you, there's a real importance to think between what is a national message and what is a local one because sometimes for example we have a great outdoor access code in scotland but then it has general messages about oh at certain times certain year you might need to keep your dog on a leak as livestock or, or ground nesting birds or whatever it may be but what matters is building people to expect that but then it to be really backed up by what's on the ground so something that's been done in scotland recently is everybody got together and uh, as you saw on one of those slides, actually got a consistent message because um, that was clear because sometimes the police were saying something different compared to the local authority and it was very, very mixed. So actually I would say agreeing some key messages, being clear what effect effectual control means in different situations and even some shared resources, but also then templates of stuff so that local rangers and site managers don't have to start from scratch, but that actually can put in information locally that actually helps deliver that at a local level. But I think the whole, the, the key thing, Helen, and it's great you picked up on it, is that you need to manage that demand. I was, remember when I was down with DCC down on Bull Island and looking at that, there were some places that were more sensitive or not, or there was a place where dog walk site parts of it where dog walking was so ingrained, probably you're never going to change that. But then there were areas that were less visited. So I'd say at the start of actually stop things getting worse and look for incremental improvements. Sometimes I see people, they'll do an initiative and they say, oh, we still had somebody do this or that, but actually it might be a bit better. So the other thing I would say is getting some baseline data so you can celebrate success or else how do you know it's working? Um, can I have a wider discussion with that? If, if you like. But yeah, those are the key things that we as professionals need to be clear ourselves what we want, where and why and manage that demand um, before we try and communicate with the public. And I think that's internationally a thing that's missing, to be honest. But it sounds like, Helen, you've got a great opportunity to solve that for everybody uh, by the insight you've shown. So no, no pressure there. Oh, this is a very collaborative project and there's a yeah. number of people on this uh, call who have a a role uh, within the development of the outdoor recreation strategy and hopefully that will mean a uh, great uh, a more focused strategy and greater ownership of it when it's completed i, I think so and i'm glad to have helped a, a wee bit on that so thank you thank you okay so time has um, got the best of us um so if you look in the chat pane you will see that kerry has kindly popped in a link to feedback survey we're really keen to hear what you thought was good about today's session and maybe things that weren't so great. I think also I have the sense that we could talk for days on this and that there will be themes that we have sort of skimmed over today. We haven't really had the time to dig down deeper into that we would like to explore more detail. So in that survey, there's also a question about um, what topics you would like to explore further. I know that Adele has asked about dog file, which I'm surprised hasn't actually been a question that we've been able to cover during the Q&A. But that may even be um, a webinar or a training event that we could do in, in its own right. So do click on that survey, complete that um, during the remainder of this webinar. We want to really hear your thoughts. Um, just in terms of some final bits of information then. So there's some future opportunities and um, we will be having future training. We've secured funding to deliver training on public rights of way. Um, at the start of this year, we delivered um, an event on current legislation um, on access um, to the outdoors for Northern Ireland. And one of the things that came up during that was that really there is a, a lack of, I suppose, knowledge um, on public rights of way. So that will be something that we will run before the end of March. I'm currently in discussions with the Institute of Public Rights of Way on what that will look like. So do look out for information on that. We also in the new year will be having um, a webinar in innovative approaches to play. So again, once the date is known and speakers, etc., um, you'll be able to book on to that. Um, the last webinar that we held on impact surveys and social return on investment, that toolkit will be available by the end of this week on the Orny website. So we'll include that in the Orny easing that will go out following this webinar. And then also just to um, highlight that currently we have two GIS 
positions available. So maybe Kerry, if you can pop a link into the chat about where people could find out more information on those. It's just if you know um, of anybody who's looking um, for a GIS role in the recreation sector, and um, we've got two going and we're really keen to secure two great team players to join us. So just following today's events, um, there will be an easing that goes out. So on that, you can watch back on this webinar. Um, I know Steve has covered a lot. I know I'll be re-watching it to, to go over what was said again. Um, so use that um, whenever it comes out. Also remember to follow us on social media. So you see our Twitter handle and LinkedIn there as well. Um, as I say, you're more than welcome to stay on afterwards and we can continue discussion for a little bit, maybe over lunch. Um, but thank you for attending. And as I say, if you want to give any more feedback, particularly in terms of topics that you would like us to cover in our training events, um, do email those through. But thank you for now. And as I say, if, if you want to stay on, just hang on to the call and we can hang around for a few more minutes. But if you want to go, um, I understand that too. That's great. Thank, thank you very much from me as well. It's always, always a pleasure and great to see all that enthusiasm. Good luck with everything. Yes, thank you very much, Steve, for today. Um, I think we will be definitely having future events with, with yourself. Um, and thank you to Cloda, to Tricia and to Carrie for those case studies. Absolutely.